our last presentation in our seminar series this year. Building up that connection with Stern Pinball, a big factory in Chicago. And so this year I'm happy to say we have their Executive Vice President and Chief Creative Officer, George Gomez. Hello, fantastic. Um, thanks for inviting me out. Um, so, what uh, I know that uh, this says a stern update, and at the end of the presentation, we're definitely going to do a stern update. But I think if I did this entire thing, a uh, stern update every time I went to a show and talked, um, since all of this stuff gets broadcast through social media and the internet, etc., you guys would be pretty bored. So today's presentation, um, I thought it would, it might be interesting. There's a lot of, um, I read a lot of interesting things online about myself. And, um, and so I thought, well, I said, um, these people clearly don't know me. <laughs> so I thought I should, I should tell you a little bit about myself tonight. So the, the beginning of the presentation, um, and actually this entire thing is, is kind of about my trip um, to arriving at being the you know chief creative officer for Stern Pinball, and so it, it really should be titled "What a Long Strange Trip This Has Been." Um, so, um, uh, so without further ado, I'm going to tell you a lot about my career before pinball, and then um, I can tell you that hopefully when you walk out of here tonight, a lot of people wonder. A lot of people say to me, you know, how did you get to be? Um, you know, where you are and what you do. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm responsible for all of the company's product development efforts. So all of the game design teams, all the engineers, all the artists, all the sound designers, everybody who makes pinball machines is essentially my responsibility. And one of my jobs is to not only um, make sure that they're making great compelling stuff, but also that um, the direction of the company is what we want it to be as pinball enthusiasts and as guys that own and play pinball machines. So um, I can tell you that there is no way that I could be doing the job I do every day had I not been all the places that I'm going to show you that I've been. And so I want you to, to kind of keep that in the back of your head when you think about, okay, so I can do my job today because of all these weird different places that I've been. So I'm gonna show you some of that. So um, I came to this country as a, as a political refugee from communism on 21 September 1962 with my family. This is, a, this is a shot in the old country. I'm the little kid in the middle, I was seven years old. Um, and um, we took what was called a Pan American Freedom Flight from Havana to Miami. And um, we, we came here with, with basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really, um, it's an American story is really what it is. Um, it's, it's something that happens all the time. People uh, come to this country for a better life. And, uh, and I'm very, very glad and very, very, uh, we'll be forever grateful to your country, which is my country now because I'm an American citizen now. Um, to give me this opportunity to have the career and the life that I've had. Um, so uh, somewhere along the line, I became an Eagle Scout. I was uh, the first in uh, 20 years of my troop. And that's me uh, presenting the President of the United States with uh, Gerald R. Ford with his Distinguished Eagle Medal. Um, so that, that's probably, um, you know, seven is uh, 10 years in the future from when I was seven. So I was probably 17 at the time. So I'm the kid that uh, you know. I'm the kid that grew up uh, sketching and drawing cars and airplanes and customizing my bicycles and building models. Uh, and my parents kind of encouraged it. So um, you know, I uh, I went I went to uh, art school. I came out with a degree in industrial design, and uh, that's what I looked like. Uh, there's there's one guy in the room that uh, knows this picture of me. <laughs> and that's Paul Ferris, because we were both working together at the time. I was 26 years old in that shot. I was working at Midway Games. It was my first job um, right out of design school. 
Um, so that, that picture, I think the calendar on the wall says uh, 1982 or something, but I started at Midway in, in the fall of 1978. I graduated from school in May of 1978. My mother, um, in, in the fall, you know, started hounding me about getting a real job. So um, I got lucky and I took, um, back in those days, designers interviewed with portfolios, you know, it was like a big giant thing that you carried around with renderings and pictures of models you built and all this stuff. And um, I, I ran around the city with a Polaroid camera, you remember those? And I took pictures of all the Midway games that I could find and I redesigned them uh, for a section of my portfolio, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know where the lines were drawn, meaning I didn't know who was, whose responsibility was what. So I did everything. I did the art on the cabinets and the controls and what should be on the screen and all this stuff. And, and out of ignorance, I, you know, and, and so when I went for my interview, you know, these guys are paging through my portfolio and at the end of the interview, this guy said to me, you know, 300 bucks a week, kid, when can you start? And, and then, you know, he's shaking my hand on the way out the door and he said, uh, I'm going to change your life, son. And I was like, oh, sure, whatever. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess, I guess he knew. <laughs> so I had, um, I had some early success. Um, uh, this is the Tron video game. Um, in 1983, Electronic Games Magazine gave me the um, uh, Video Game of the Year award. Those are my actual storyboards um, from the video game, which you guys haven't seen. They're in the permanent collection of the Strong Museum in New York. Uh, it's a, the Strong Museum of Play Rochester. in New York, in Rochester, New York. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to go up there, it's an amazing place. It's, uh, you know, I think they're, it's it's like a real deal museum with curators and all this stuff. But um, so those are my hand built, um, and you can see there was you, the light cycles are clearly evident. The tanks, um, you know, change a little bit, and the the, the thing in the that looks like a spider in the center. Um, each one of those uh, things that simulates a um, a computer chip, we're representing a wave in the game. Um, the concept was you start in the center and just like. The real game, you you know, kind of pick the direction you go in the direction into the computer. So some sometime after I did these, you know, reality intruded, and so the game that you see that you know um, was you know evolved from this. But this is like this was very very early thinking, right after we just read the scripts from Disney and went away and started designing this stuff. Um, later on, I also had success with this one, right? Um, um, Spy Hunter, which I'm going to show you some. I'm going to show you some fun Spy Hunter stuff. Uh, so in, in um, must have been 2008. Um, this happened. So, um, so now, believe it or not, you know, I did I did two tours of duty at Midway Games. I was at Midway Games from October of 1978 until sometime in 1984, and um, and then I went back to Midway Games many many years later in my career. And I was at Midway Games when this happened, and, and the ad agency for Pontiac called us up and said, you know what, the demographic for this car, like the guys we want buying the Pontiac G8, are the guys who were playing your game when they were you know, 12. And so that's why they made this commercial. And so they asked us permission, and I was like, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> um, and last summer I was at the Lego store in Fifth Avenue in New York, and I stumbled on this. And um, of note, I don't know if you guys can see this, but you see at the bottom there on the right, G6155 Spy Hunter. Okay, so back in the day, the company was very afraid that we were all going to become rock stars and they wouldn't let us sign our games. So all of our stuff was snuck into the game. So 6155 is my birthday and G is my initial. 
<clears throat> and so I thought it was really nice that the Lego guys preserved it. <laughs> And then uh, somewhere, Spy Hunter went on to be a, a, um, a, a long-running video game franchise into the console era. And um, long after I had anything to do with it, a bunch of guys working on the game, who were at Midway at the time, who knew me, because I was also at Midway working on different stuff, said to me, we're, we want to make you the bad guy in the game. <laughs> so, I don't know, there's a version of me, of Spy Hunter for the PlayStation 2 or 3, I can't remember, which has me running around the game, you know, trying to, you know, um, trying my hand at world domination. So, uh, <laughs> so and when they, did, when they did their presentation, they brought up this painting, and they made of me as the bad guy, and, and the guy, doing the presentation, running the video game team said, and so, the bad guy, George Gomez, is Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've done novelty games, lots of different, you know, I, and th there's no, by the way, there's, a li there's some timeline shifts in here, because you'll see some dates on here that don't make sense to you, and that's because in 2008, Midway blew up, and I was out of a job, and for for about, um, I don't know, six months or something, I was doing anything and everything for anyone, and so I, I tried my hand at a bunch of different novelty games. And so this was, you can see, an, I had this idea for a Wally -E Crane game. See that up there? And, um, and then, of course, a rock and sock and robot, uh, lar lar larger than life. Um, this is a thing I did while I was in Midway in my second tour of duty. Um, the video game companies, just like pinball companies, they live and die by the success of a current title. And so this creates a really bad business thing where you have these incredible peaks and followed by incredible valleys. And so you know, you're only as good as your last game kind of thing. And so it occurred to me that why don't we have a, a, what we call you know, a bread and butter product line, something that would be agnostic to, the, to whether we had a hit game or not. And so Midway had a strong history of, of, of in, the, in the arcades, and so I thought, why don't I do a line of peripherals that are Midway branded? So I, I, I came up with this thing called RACE, Real Arcade Control Equipment, and, and it was intended for to plug into the consoles, and it would work with anybody's game. But there was a twist, and the twist was that when the Midway peripheral saw the Midway game, Let's, let's say you connected a Midway um, gun game or a Midway driving game to the console with the peripheral, then it unlocked things that weren't, weren't available in any other way unless the peripheral was uh, connected to it. So the, the whole line of, you know, the idea was when Electronic Arts has a hot game, we can have a peripheral that works with it, but um, when uh, when, when it's connected to the Midway game, it unlocks things that it doesn't unlock in anybody else's game. Um, this is a novelty game that I did for Lauren Bromley. Um, Bromley is a company noted for uh, ticket spitters. This was an attempt to um, basically replicate the Whirly Birds and those kinds of games from, um, from that era. And so, um, you know, this worked just like, this was back when Gulf Wars were popular. Um, this is about 1990 or so. And um, my old buddy, Kevin O'Connor, and I, who we've done many, many games together, and uh, he was the artist on this. And uh, if you look closely at this thing, I'm, I'm the pilot. You know, it's, it's got my name on the, on the side of the helicopter and, um, and on the, helm the guy's helmet. So in 1984, when the video game business tanked, I left Midway and I went to work at a company called Marvin Glass and Associates, the most, invent, the most famous toy inventor, uh, invention to uh, company in the world in the history of toys. Um, consulting firm in Chicago, and I worked there for about five years as a toy inventor inventing toys. And this is a thing that I did. Um, this was a, a, an, a, a concept to do a line of wearable, um, um, like jewelry kinds of things for boys. So this was uh, like a watch. If you look closely, you know, it had a little LCD watch, and when you open it, 
Uh, it's got a little guy inside, and it launches the little guy out. Uh, this is another toy that I did while I was there. No one told you what to do. So every day I went to work, I didn't have a boss, I didn't work for anyone, I worked for myself. And so whatever I did that day is what I did that day. And so um, it was really, really kind of fun because you could, like, you know, this week you, you could be working on a board game, next week you could have an idea for an outdoor water toy, and you could be playing around with that. Um, so I did a lot of really diverse stuff, mostly boys' toys because that's what I could relate to. That's how, you know, I grew up with all, all that stuff, and so I, I really kind of um, uh, had a lot of fun with it. Um, so my second tour of duty at Midway Games, I worked on a console basketball game. It was called a lifestyle basketball game, meaning that it was, uh, you know, it was like one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two um, for, for, you know, Xbox and PlayStation. Uh, it was called NBA Ballers. Um, I spent nine years of my life um, <laughs> working on this franchise, if you can believe it. Um, and, um, and one thing that this afforded me was, this was after Williams had, had, this was after Pinball 2000, and Williams had basically gotten out of the pinball business. And while I was doing this, Gary Stern approached me and said, hey, would you do pinball machines on the side for me? And so a lot of the games that I'm known for with you guys, I did as a consultant designer to Gary Stern. Because, so I went to see Midway, I said, do you guys have any issue with this? They said, no, it's not really a conflict of interest. It's, and I told Gary, I said, don't put me in the schedule, because these things will be done when they're done. But, so I did, um, I did uh, Playboy the Sopranos, Lord of the Rings, Batman the Dark Knight, um, all, um, I made some, maybe I did something else, I can't remember, all as an outside consultant to, um, to Stern Pitball. Uh, while I was running the NBA Ballers team. So uh, um, it, was a, it was a busy time of my life. Uh, some more, more shots from NBA Ballers. Um, and then uh, this is the portfolio of games of pinball, pinball designs that you know me for. Um, so these are all the games that I've designed. Um, notice the little Supreme logo at the bottom there, because yes, I did the, 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 I did the Supreme layout. Um, and I also did the Spider-Man home pin. Um, th there are two pinball machines that are not up here that I, that, I, um, that I was a designer on, and that was the home version of Transformers and the home version of, of uh, Avengers. Um, but all of these other ones, you know, it, and it all started with um, uh, Corvette. Uh, so in, in, in sequence, if you look to the far left side of the screen, it's uh, Corvette, and the far right side of the screen, uh, it's Batman 66, which is the last thing that I've done. Um, I know it's rumored that I have another one coming out at the end of the summer, and I'm here to tell you the rumor is true. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so in sequence, just so just so you guys, uh, and I'll get lost somewhere because I'm, I don't remember. As I'm, I just turned 63, so I'm really old. I'm a really old guy, and my memory's starting to go. Um, so Corvette was the first. Uh, that was at. Uh, um, I went to work at Williams Electronics in. Um, I want to say it was uh, August, May or August of 1993, and. Um, and a year later, in 1994, uh, Corvette came out. Um, I followed Corvette up with Johnny Mnemonic, and then NBA Fast Break, and then Monster Bash, um, and then Revenge from Mars. My first game for Gary Stern as consultant was Playboy. It, was the, it would be the third iteration of Playboy. 
Um, and it was fun. I got, you know, I, I got the proverbial trip to the Playboy Mansion and all that stuff. Um, and, and it was really cool. He had uh, in, the, in, in the little uh, game room um, off in the woods, uh, I forget what he called it, the guest house, Paul? I can't remember. Game house. Game house, thank you. Um, and, and so he had all the games and he had all three versions of the game in there. And it was, it, that was really fun. Um, so I think, I think I did Playboy, followed by Sopranos, followed by Lord of the Rings, followed by The Dark Knight. I may have one of those flipped, but I can't remember. Um, and then I did uh, Transformers as I was beginning to do my, my current job as uh, you know, head of product development. I had started Transformers as a consultant for the company, and so I finished it once I came in. By the way, it's really hard to do my full-time job and design a game, so you're not, that's why I don't, I'm not in a regular um, cycle with the rest of my designers. And I, while I love to do it, um, um, it's just really, really, really difficult thing. So it takes me longer, and it's just a, it's, it, you know, I live there, and it's, it's bad. <laughs> but, um, um, and remember, the games today are substantially more complicated because we're creating a pro model, a premium edition, and a limited edition, and, um, and there's all of these other things that go with that, and so, um, it's a lot of work. So much for um, the, you know, the lead-in to Stern Pinball. Um, and now you notice the slides all changed and they have a Stern bug at the bottom on the right. And then, because now, now we're in official Stern land. Um, so Stern Pinball, leading a renaissance in pinball, creating a global lifestyle brand. That's, I mean, you guys think of us as a pinball company. But the executive team at, at Stern, uh, we think of ourselves as um, in those terms. You know, we, we say we're bringing pinball back. That's what we're about. We're all about all things pinball. We want to occupy the entire space of pinball uh, in terms of we want to have a footprint in lots of different places. And you see, you've seen us dabble with some, and you're going to see more of it. Um, and so. We think of ourselves as creating a global lifestyle brand that's based on pinball. Um, we, work, we, you know, we we think that part of what we're doing is enabling um, a generation of people that grew up with virtual games to discover the coolness of our game. You know, our game is a much more visceral game. It's a much more uh, physical thing, and it's much harder to to duplicate our product in all of those other um, mediums. It doesn't mean that we won't have a footprint in those mediums, because you know we do. Um, but but our, our heart and our soul lives around that inch and a sixteenth you know, um, sphere, right? And, and flippers. And most of the time I tell my designers that the only, you know, the only thing that's sacred is the ball and the flippers. They can do a lot of other things, but the game really is beneath the glass for us. And, and certainly on my watch, that's, that's what I want. So um, you guys are part of this. You guys are, every one of you is here because you're part of this global community that's casual players, collectors, and tournament players. And that's, you know, we thank you. You allow me to um, to go to work to do something I really love, and I thank you. Um, we work with really strong licensing partners. It's not that we don't. It's not that we don't. We, we don't want to do original stuff. We do. We we and you'll see some original stuff from us. But we get a lot of traction from the strength of our partners. You saw us do the Mustang game. Um, Ford was a tremendous partner. You know, those are, see those pinball machines? They're lined up at the Chicago Auto Show. The Chicago Auto Show is the, the biggest auto show in the world. And we had, um, you know, prime real estate on the floor of the show with those pinball machines. They were all on free play. They were there to introduce the, whatever it was, you know, 50,000 people that walked through that show to pinball. And of course, part of our, you know, part of our, 
our, our licenses, our partners that are into the thing that we're making. And so, you know, that's James Hetfield with his pinball machine um, and, and Steven signing somebody's pinball machine, right? So, um, you know, I think that, that um, it's, it's, this, it's this diversity in interests and, and the crossover of all of these different areas that makes us, um, that helps us in, in, our, in our quest to become a global lifestyle brand. The games, as you know, go all over the world, right? So um, a large part of our market is still um, overseas. And so I, I, love, I love going out there and, and looking at the labels. Um, this happens, these are old labels because I, I especially do this when my games are on the line. So when my games are on the line, I go to the back of the line, I take pictures of all of the uh, strange places that my games go. So I've had, you know, I've got games in Dubai and, you know, the Czech Republic and Denmark and all these other places. And it's kind of fun. Um, and so a lot of times, sometimes you guys look at stuff and you don't understand why things are the way they are. And some of the things that, that um, some of the reasons that things are the way they are is because we are serving a global market. And so some of the compromises that we have to make in product in one part of the world is because of demands from another part of the world. We have 110,000 square feet in Elk Grove Village, and if you're ever in, in, in the Chicago area, you're welcome to come out. It doesn't take much to line up a tour. Um, we've got a free play arcade that you can certainly stop by and play all of our stuff. Um, we also, in, in, in addition to that, you know that we're a big part of the Chicago, the Ex Pinball Expo Tour. Um, how many people here have been to the factory? Okay, so um, the rest of you, We've not been to the factory. Please come to the factory. Um, we'd love to show you around. Uh, we're very proud of what we do. Um, we're not perfect. We screw stuff up all the time. We make a lot of games. Um, we replicate our mistakes sometimes. And but but I can tell you that um, we do everything we can to make it right. And 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 we we continue to we continue to believe in that. It's a philosophical thing to try to improve to the point where your games are great when you get them and they don't need anything. Um, it's something that we are, we're not there yet. I don't know if we'll ever be there, but I know that we try every day. And so there's, there's been a lot of influence this past year, or a lot of um, effort this past year into hiring more professional mass production manufacturing guys, guys that are bringing in technology and techniques that are new to pinball. Um, we have the beginnings of a Six Sigma program, the beginnings of a lot of qual traditional quality things that are happening. But these things take time. They don't happen overnight. It takes a while. Um, and they're very involved. But we're going there. So you're going to see one of the coolest things is that we make games as long as there's demand for them. So if you look closely, um, this guy's uh, testing uh, one of the home transformers. But next to him is a star. Uh, Star Trek, and and um, over behind him you see a Medieval Madness, right? Because we made those for Chicago Gaming. So um, so there's there's we we make a lot of different product. Um, I'm just gonna snap through some shots of uh, from the factory. These are just random shots of me walking around the factory taking pictures. Lots of cable. Lots of sparkies. Um, yeah, these guys can be scary at night when you're leaving. <laughs> um, again, again, think, look, look closely, and you'll see three different versions of The Walking Dead. You'll see a Transformers uh, consumer game in the background. Um, I believe you'll see a Star Trek in there. So. Um, we have two lines, and at any given point in time, there are different games running on the line. And it's not uncommon for game titles to switch from week to week, which, if you think about it, is an amazing thing. That means that the workstations, the, the work cells that, that build the sub-assemblies get completely repopulated with another game's content, and all those people get, get a, a quick overview of you know, okay, here's the new stuff. 
And, and it, you know, last week we were building, you know, um, Maiden and Star Trek. Next week it's going to be something else, um, two other games. So um, very flexible. Uh, we have we have a footprint in the accessory business, which we've done very well with. Um, sometimes I know there's going to be some guys in the audience going to ask me about the R2D2 topper for Star Wars. Let me beat you to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> It's all done. It's been all done. We, um, um, uh, the folks at Lucas are um, very particular about their colors and their finishes and things. And so as soon as we get uh, full approval, you guys will have it. We want to get it to you as soon as we can. We're very close. We're very, very close. I've only specified reflex blue about 65 different times. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is a playfield um, wear test. You ever seen this? So um, we really do test our stuff. We test the crap out of it. We test it to destruction. Most of the time, when you get our stuff and it breaks, it's not because we didn't test it. It's because we designed the wrong test. Or something's happening that we don't anticipate happen. Or, some, or a vendor has replaced something has essentially, um, you know, changed a material and a component, et cetera. Um, it doesn't make us flawless. We still screw stuff up, but um, we do test the uh, we do test the crap out of stuff. Um, so we test all kinds of things. Like for example, um, hard coats get tested, and sometimes they get cleaned, and sometimes they don't get cleaned, and sometimes they get cleaned with the wrong stuff because people are going to do that. And so we, we really do try to figure out what's going on. In addition to that, the other thing to know is that sometimes we see, we see things in our own games, right? Because every one of the guys in my department own and, 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 and uh, play our own games, right? So when, when, when I take a game home, when I take a Batman home and it does something wrong, I, I go back and I try to fix it. And I can't fix everything that's already gone out the door, but I, I try to make sure that the next time they build it, um, I'm going to try to revise it. And if it's necessary, I'll do a service bulletin. And if it's necessary, we'll do a kit to send out to you. So everybody loves a hero, right? There's all this conversation about designers and, and uh, lead software guys, and et cetera. Um, by the way, that's, that's Lyman and I signing Batman play fields over on the far right. Um, that's me with the Batmobile when I was working on The Dark Knight. They shot it in uh, Chicago on LaSalle Street, and that's, that's on the set of The Dark Knight. The reality is that these games are made by teams, by development teams. Very, very complex development teams with lots of different talent. It's not just uh, two guys. And, um, and all of those guys bring a specialty to it. And all of those specialties cross over. So. Um, when every, everything you see up there, a game designer, a software developer, a mechanical engineer, sometimes there's multiples of those. So multiple software developers, one lead developer, the one that you guys always see, talk about or, or hear about, but behind him there's a bunch of guys helping him execute on the product. Uh, there's Forgy and Lonnie working on something. Okay, so um, I can't stress enough the impact, um, the contribution that the teams make, right? This couldn't happen without the teams. And the teams are into the games, and they play the games every day. They, um, when, when we're about three or four months out from shipping a game, the teams start, they do a thing we call dailies. They start uh, every day at 10 o'clock, the entire team gathers around that game, and we talk about what needs to be done that day, that week, and that's how we drive a game to finish all the way through. And a lot of times we have to put games in a box that are not ready to go in a box because of business reasons. We have every intent to finish anything we didn't finish. Um, you've seen a whole spur of code come out from us. I promised you guys, whatever it was, six months ago or something, that we were going to be doing this, and, and, and it's been happening. Um, before the summer's out, you'll see a KISS update. Before the summer's out, you'll see an Aerosmith update. You're going to see continuous, you're, you'll, you'll probably see another Maiden update very shortly with some bug fixes and a couple of improvements. You're going to see it. 
Batman probably will get to 1.0 relatively soon. We will um, um, finish a lot of stuff that we've got in the works. So I don't know how many, has everybody seen the Iron Maiden movie? Okay, so I'll play, I'll play you that. <coughs> My name is Keith Owen. I'm a game designer here at Stern Pinball, and this is my game, Iron Maiden. <laughs> hear about Keith Owen if you got into playing pinball. You would hear that, hey, there's this player who's won, you know, seven world pinball championships. He can keep like four balls on one flipper and then play pinball with the other. He always is completely in control. I started playing in tournaments when I was around 20 years old. I qualified, I did really well. I've been doing tournaments ever since. I've always stuck with it. And then I had an opportunity to, see, to make it and I said, yeah, yeah. Okay, he's done everything there is to do in competitive pinball, and now he's taking what he knows and he's bringing it to designing pinball machines. This is my first game. I was hired to do this design, and that's where it was born. Yeah, so a mechanical designer named Harrison, so this was his first professional uh, pinball design. And as soon as I got in the door, I was you know, on the ground running, working on this project. Our software engineer, Rick Nagel, he was brought on to kind of handle programming all the rules that I had come up with for this game. I'm the technical muscle for, for peace and all knowledge. Everybody looked up and respected me for some reason because they thought I knew what I was talking about, so it was great. You know, we're working in the shadow of some giants here at CERN, so we really had to make a splash on our first game. So, rookies. know that it was an Iron Maiden game until my first day. I started listening to them when I was really young, probably younger than I should have been. Sort of hit the uh, theme jackpot is something I'd like to work on. This is definitely a dream theme. I really like this design. We haven't done a, a four flipper game in probably 15 years. This game brings that back, but I think that's going to be a unique draw for the player. With the four flippers, the upper two flippers allows you to play more of the pinball machine than just the bottom part. I think when you get stuck in the bottom part for too long, the back looks very distant, and then when you have that flipper up there, it feels like, okay, I'm up there, I have the control of the upper part of the play field. Usually the ramps are some of your easiest shots in the game. Keep up the ramps on the outside of the game, and spinners and some loops in the middle of the game, and make those the big shots, and make ramps the tough shots. What it actually winds up building is a more flowing game, because the ball is always near a flipper, and that flipper can always affect it. This is the mechanism for the center lift ramp on premium and LV models. So when you collect enough eddy letters, the ramp will raise to reveal this underworld scoop. The player can then shoot into the scoop, the ramp will close, we'll get you another presentation, and then the ramp will re-raise and fire the ball back at the player. I would approach Harrison with my napkin scribbling, and then he would ask me for a CAD file. He would turn it into a uh, SOLIDWORKS file, and then we'd prototype it. Sure enough, it would work, and then uh, we'd move on to the next device. One of the big main features that Keith wanted on every model of Iron Maiden was going to be the bullseye target. The segment is broken up into three sections, so you have an outer ring, a middle ring, and then the center bullseye target. Um, so those all independently control a switch on the back, and then our software can determine which one was the highest value that you hit. The premium offers more kinetic satisfaction because the uh, devices are more interactive. So Keith's big thing during the development of this game was to make sure that he was kinetically satisfied. And for the longest time, I had to figure out that Matt. Turns out, even if it's a successful hit, it has to feel like you actually hit it. So the new Newton ball mechanism tries to bring a captive ball experience without actually having to take up the room of the captive ball. So it's a 360 degree omnidirectional sensing target. Kinetic satisfaction. <laughs> On the shoot, the rules are good, the sounds good, the artwork's stunning, so that, that's going to draw the new players in. Our artist extraordinaire, uh, Zombie Yeti, he's a big Maiden fan, and he, he was all excited about it. You know, it takes over a year from CAD files to it actually getting built. I'm not, you know, the whole time I, I was just, now, what's it actually going to be like when this is on the line? I was so busy leading up to that point, I don't think I really had time to like just inhale and, and uh, take it in. The day came up faster than I thought, I and mean, it, was, it was just kind of a dream. I was just, oh, oh yeah, look, there it is. And uh, it is very cool to walk down the line and see something you built and getting shipped off to Italy, Germany, and all these other places they're going right now.
guys. Um, <clears throat> those guys are part of uh, an effort <clears throat> to bring in some fresh blood um, you know, into my group. Um, I've got a bunch of new young guys, uh, some that you'll meet soon, you haven't met them yet, um, like these guys that, um, you know, because we're all kind of getting long in the tooth. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, I think that at some point we have to, you know, we have to replicate ourselves. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm just going to show you some random stuff out of my portfolio that just I thought you might find interesting. This is some of my Lord of the, Run, Lord of the Rings stuff. I'm just talk about some of the uh, process kind of things that we do. So, you know, I, I start this way, not everybody does, but I sketch a lot and I, I do a lot of sort of what I call visual thinking, where I'm kind of talking myself through or out of things um, before I start building things. So you can see this is a very early Lord of the Rings sketch. It, 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 there are some similarities to the play field you know, but there's also some stuff that you've never seen before. Um, lots of it, you know, I mean, I just go back and forth. I talk, I talk myself in and out of things. Um, I use these sketches all the time to communicate with my design teams. Um, it's a way to get everybody on the same page. Um, it's also a way to start a dialogue, which um, improves the design. Uh, some interesting stuff. You guys always like to see things you haven't seen. Look at the bottoms of those play fields. Um, I think one of those bottoms you've never seen before. Right. Um, sometimes it's a different game, but it's it's more of the same kind of stuff. Um, at some point, the, the the modeling goes. You know, the sketching becomes modeling. Um, what you see here is you see you're seeing the um, the, the teeter totter ramp on the dark night, and you're seeing my phone cores uh, up in the right um, corner there. You're seeing my sketch of how it would go, how it'd be built together. Um, I, I don't, you know, I have a lot of respect for my mechanical engineers to the point that I like to, I do not like to throw stuff over the fence. And so I kind of like, the, the, the more you leave something to someone else's execution, the less it will be the thing you envisioned. So in order, and, and call that, call me a control freak, but I like to control. Um, my designs, and so I work very, very closely with the engineer um, to get what I want. Here's some of my Hulk stuff, um, the CG model of Hulk, and um, you know some of the early sketches of how it would work. Um, this is a thing I did for my friend Steve Ritchie, right? The dragon on um, on Game of Thrones. Um, um, you know those guys were really busy with what they were doing, and so. Um, I came up with uh, the device that flapped the wings on the dragon. Uh, we do almost all of our sculpting is not done the old-fashioned way anymore. Uh, almost all of it is happening uh, in the computer. Um, we've got um, a bunch of digital sculptors that we work with, uh, and, and it's inside and outside. And um, we we sculpt digitally, and then we um, you know we rapid prototype it. That's a that's a print of the dragon that you see there, that white thing, and then those are the CG models of the dragon. Um, have you ever seen what code looks like? That's what code looks like. You guys talk about it all the time in the forums, but nobody ever, um, that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, that's Tony DeFeo, um, one of the software engineers uh, working away. Dwight Sullivan. Uh, working on, on the Game of Thrones Whitewood. Um, he fills his Whitewood with concepts and then sits down to execute. Um, at some point, the, you know, the, um, this is 2D CAD where we still have, uh, there's certain things like we, let, we do quick layouts in 2D CAD, uh, but we, then we quickly go to 3D CAD. And so um, uh, we have, we use, um, we use both tools. It's faster for us to do a quick a quick shot layout in 2D CAD, and uh, and then and then transition to 3D, and so we transition to 3D CAD. Um, as you you saw in Keith's movie, you saw his 2D shot layout, and then you saw the SolidWorks um, 3 3D CAD. This is uh, some of the early stuff on the on the Batman crane, um, which um, you, you can see my foam core. At one point, the top of the crane was a ramp. 
it was a ramp that would divert the ball. And then, of course, the actual mechanism, you can see the foam core there, and then you can see the real uh, execution. This is, um, this is a, a sample thing that, um, uh, this is a, a conversation, I know this is, looks like a sketch, and it is, but it's a conversation. This is a conversation between the artist, myself, and the programmer about um, colors and communicating the ideas of the rules of the game. So you'll see these a lot laying around the studio. Um, with, and, and, and if you look at, if you read the things on here, you can see um, that these instructions are both about rules and they're about art and they're about colors and how to communicate to a player what it is that you want them to do. Um, this is uh, in the factory when we were getting ready to de debut um, the Batman games. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of the bat signal. That was that was kind of really fun fun touch. Um, by the way, if you haven't ordered a bat signal because you're concerned about the the fuzzies on the outside of the of the um, um, of the bat, um, that's that the. Um, the lens is a lens that we, we purchased, and we added the bat to it. So we had very little control of, of um, what the manufacturer of the projector did with the projector. And that's why we had all those complaints about the fuzzies on the outside. But we, came, we actually came up with a fix. Um, so if you've been holding back on ordering a bat signal because you don't like the fuzzies, current day bat signals have no fuzzies. <laughs> Um, there's Mr. West and I at the at Expo. Um, it was really, really uh, kind of fun to uh, uh, meet him and uh, and 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 get to know him while uh, while I still could. And then at the end of the day, this is you know this is really what it's all about. Is that they're not refrigerators. They're they're pinball machines. They're you know they're for playing. They're for fun. They're for enjoying. They're not for polishing or storing or preserving <laughs> to some extent. I think preserve away, but please play them. <laughs> um, and that's, that's my presentation, and I'll, I'll take questions. So line up over here for questions. Come over here and get some water. Yeah, and I'll bring it to you later. Okay, I guess bring it to you now. George will have us walk back to the podium to think about the George, I have a Batman and the projector. I don't really mean about the fuzzies. You know? What are the fuzzies? I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, some people complain that the, the you know, so. Uh, the, oh, the image? Yeah, on the image, oh, on okay. the perimeter of the image, right? It's, it's uh, the you know, the. The further you are, the less obvious they are. But but the thing that you can't control is, like on this on this ceiling, they would probably look fine. But when a guy when a guy has a game right here, and he points it at that wall, and the wall's like two feet away from it, it's uh, yeah. It's like you know you're gonna see every little thing. My tiny loose little golf figure. I don't know why. Thanks very much. Okay, questions. One over. George, first of all, thank you. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> big, uh, big dream of mine to have one of these. Um, question just about pinball connectivity and online and the ability. I've heard you talk about in the past. Just when can we expect to potentially have tournaments just from our home? And yeah, so we're going to do, um, so the games, uh, we should have them on, um, with any luck, um, we should have them online um, later in the year. So um, I'm not entirely sure what game it, it's going to debut on, um, and we're but yeah we are working on it and um, it's it's a lot of stuff we have. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but we have three we have uh, three initiatives, and and in, in terms of um, steps along the way to uh, to getting you what you want. Um, the very first thing that we're working on though is is the ability to um, allow you to download code. Just like you do for your for anything, you know, an update for your computer or whatever. So um, that's probably the first thing you'll see from us. And then there's a whole stream of features that 
will come after that. Will we have the ability to apply those that technology to older games or to a, games? Uh, to a certain to um, to a certain point. Yeah. In other words, they're, it's not going to be backward compatible for everything, but it's going to be backward compatible for some games. Thank you for all you all you do. I have Lord of the Rings. I love Avengers. I know you may not, but I, I love that game. The new games have these spike boards, and many of us like to fix games as much as we love to play them, but we can't fix the spike game. Yep. We have to buy the board. Now, working on that right now, actually. Um, very soon, you're going to see not only um, a very detailed manual on, on, on spike, how it works, what it does. I, we understand it's a black box to you. Um, but it's taken us some time to actually write a manual that you know I, a lot of people can use. Um, so you'll see the manual first. You'll also see a series of um, training sessions available both online and and at uh, events like this uh, to teach people how to handle and, and work with the system. Yeah. How much has the software part of your team grown over the past couple of years? Um, so my entire team has grown. So um, I have more uh, software engineers, more mechanical engineers. Um, you saw, uh, uh, you know, I have, so uh, the four game designers right now, um, not counting myself, because I don't count myself in that, uh, in that, in that but um, um, Steve Ritchie and John Borg, uh, John's here somewhere, and um, Brian Netty is new to us. You know, you'll see a game from Brian in about a year. Um, and, uh, and of course, Keith. Um, and so those are the game designers. Um, Harrison Drake is a new mechanical engineer. Um, um, Elliot Eisman, the mechanical engineer on Ghostbusters, is a fairly new guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, those two guys coach a robotics team together, a high school robotics team together, and that's how I got. Um, I hired Elliot, and then uh, shortly after, you know, maybe a year later, I hired uh, Harrison because uh, um, Elliot said, uh, hey, my buddy, you know, is, is really good, and he wants in, so. Um, so there's um, all, all of my um, all of my teams are growing. My computer graphics team has grown some. Um, so yes, we as as the company does better, um, as the hobby grows, um, then you know I can expand my resources. Yeah, that's great. And robotics, uh, a lot of the robotics competitions are running out of New Hampshire. So around this part of the country, you can probably find a lot of people who are into that mechanical action. Yep. I'd like to have a career with your company. Yep. Uh, how many how many different kinds of ways do you get designs in? Because you've got this studio system. I'm not quite sure is that yeah. is that something you approve or do you someone just come with a deal right. and you make it for them, or is there both deals possible? Right, so okay, so um, I refer to the studio as, as my product development team, right? My entire product development team. And it, within my within within my studio, I have four development teams, and so um, the, the four teams are driven by the four game designers. Um, and then there are there are lead software engineers, guys like Lyman Sheets and Lonnie Rupp, um, uh, Dwight Sullivan, and and they pair up with a game designer. And then um, there's you, typically there's a project engineer, somebody like Harrison Drake. There's there's a bunch of other guys that, that um, um, you know Rob Blakeman, John Rothman, all these guys have been around for a long time, and so so that's the core of a team. And then there's all these other guys that backfill them and help them out. Um, and so so the um, there's a there are some people that rotate with a team, you know, or and I'm sorry, some people that rotate from team to team. So when a team, the teams are staggered, right? The schedules are staggered. So it, we introduce three, what we call cornerstone titles a year. Um, that's three main games that we get a pro premium and LE with. And so each of those teams is staggered. Um, the schedules are somewhere between 13 and 14 months. And, and so, um, and a development cycle depending. And so, um, uh, when the, the, the support guys move from game to game, and um, as a team finishes, they'll they'll go on to start their next game. But I was also asking about the outside studios. 
So the outside studios, um, the only real outside studio that we've had um, that has actually like provided, you know, a, a, like a working concept uh, was um, Greg Ferris and uh, uh, um, and and Dennis Nordman when they did uh, Wonelli. That came to us. You guys had seen Wonelli. Um, you know, you guys had seen Wonelli. Um, uh, but but most of the um, most of the outside studio work so far, um, most of it has actually been done inside. So it's it's been uh, maybe it's been branded, you know, it's been co-branded, co-branded. But um, in the case of Batman, uh, Kapow, um, uh, Joe Kamikow was instrumental in helping us get the Batman license, and so um, you know that's why the Kapow branding is on the game. Yeah, and. You have other uh, outside studio designs that you. If you have anything signed, I guess is probably the best thing. Um, Definitely. We uh, have. Um, let, so let's not confuse studios with other, like for example, um, private label games. Right. Okay, so private label games are developed inside. Like Supreme was a private label game. A private label game is when someone comes to us, like uh, Pep's Blue Ribbon. And they say, can you guys make us a fast delivery and pinball machine? And if, if there's a business case for this, then we'll figure out a way to do that. That's how we did the PBR can crusher, right? right. And, um, and Supreme, that's how we did Supreme. Supreme came to us and said, hey guys, we want to do a pinball machine. And, and we said, okay, um, you know, we figured out how to do it um, for them within a platform that we had, right? We, it was, um, if you look at Supreme Game, it's actually a hybrid. It's not, the, it's not pure consumer uh, Spidey. It's, um, it's mostly the consumer Spidey play field with some evolutions. I made some changes because it was sort of an opportunity to evolve it, so I did. I had a different display, so we did some different things with the rules and some of the presentation elements. It's, got a, it's in a pro cabinet um, with uh, a modern back box and an old display. So it's truly a hybrid. Um, you know that that particular game was truly a hybrid. So we do um, to clarify. So we do three cornerstone titles a year. Each cornerstone will always get a pro premium in an LA, right? In addition to that, we do what we call private label games like Supreme or Pat's Blue Ribbon, etc. Um, we do vaults. A vault is something that you guys love that we're bringing back out of the Stern Vault. And, and usually vaults, the nice thing about vaults is that they're somewhat improved because we've seen them in the field for a while. And so we get, a, we get to fix things that we didn't get right the first time. So we did, you know, like you saw a Spider-Man vault and you saw an uh, Iron Man vault. Both of those are really, really nice games. Um, so those are different from like just remaking Star Trek because when we remake Star Trek, more often than not, it's just like Star Trek Unless it's called a vault, it's not really, um, you know, games have to be dormant for some amount of time before we, you know, consider them a vault. Is it also a matter of the void system? Um, which, which board set? Like, which board, yes, to some extent, although, you know, soon we'll be all out of, you know, um, we'll have to be in a new board set. So, like, you know, if I want the, if I want the vault board, uh, Lord of the Rings, right, I would have to almost port it. To a, to a modern hardware because that hardware is just, you know, we can't even make it anymore. Some of those parts are end of life. Okay, so we got Vault. So we have Vault. Oh, yeah, have, studio. Yes. Um, we have cornerstones. some outside studio cornerstones and, and, and private label. And contract manufacturing if you ever had any spare time. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that's all the five, five right. different and ways I'm, to make people. <clears throat> yes, you can tell why I'm kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. When it comes to a game like Iron Maiden, did you guys have to go for the license to the people who own the music? Or did you have to go to the band? So licenses are, um, you know, licenses are very complex because um, in some cases uh, a band owns all of its music, but in some cases it doesn't, uh, or the music is, is split across several publishers. Um, that so some and and a lot of times. The, the licensor will tell us what music we can or can't have. Some, in some cases, the band will tell us what music we can or can't have, right? Like, um, 
Um, Metallica was proactive in telling us what music we could have, um, and and the same I think I think Maiden was also, you know. And so it's like everybody says, you know, I want this Maiden song. Well, if I can't get it, I can't, you can't have it. <laughs> so licensing is a very complex thing. It's very complex because every licensor is different. Every licensor brings with it different approval set, you know, different approval requirements. Uh, different constraints. It's one of the most difficult things that we do is uh, bring a title on, you know, with a, with a license to market because, because um, getting approvals from this guy are very different from getting approvals from that guy. In some cases you get certain things, in some cases you don't, you know. In the case of, like for example, Guardians, you know, we, we got very little in the way of participation, video participation from the actors. Uh, speech, th those kinds of things. You know, Walking Dead, we got none. So, you know, it's it's like everybody says, you know, how come you didn't do this and this and this? Well, it's because we couldn't. Would you rather work with the music industry or the movie industry? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, I, we've we've made, you know, we've had some partners that have been very easy to work with, and some partners that have been a little bit more challenging. How about a partner that you remember as being? Really eager to be represented in the pinball. Uh, Metallica, you know, Metallica was, you know, they were into the game. Um, when they put when they put our pinball machine on their website, um, you know, their website has you know 30 million people on it, right? So when you put a certain pinball machine on the Metallica website, it, it crashed our website. Our website was down for a week and a half. <laughs> our guys didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Good problem to have. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Come on up. I'll, I'll keep thinking up questions. Actually, we, we have gone an hour, so come on up. Come on up. Just a quick question. It's easy for the recording. Have you kept track of how many patents in your career you've, you've uh, submitted and had approved? Yeah. Um, I've got a few. <laughs> I've got a few. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting you ask me this question. Um, I, you know, that. Uh, um, and, and you know, patents expire, right? So a bunch of my patents are dead, right? I have, uh, like in the Pinball 2000, I have, um, I have a patent on the coincidence between a virtual object and a real object, right? Um, so the, you know, the notion of sensing that the ball has hit a video Martian, right? Um, but I think that, that patent's set over 17 years old. It's probably expired. It's probably no good. Um, so I think uh, there's a patent on the con you know the notion of connect you know unlocking a feature in a video game because of a peripheral. That's my patent. So um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, so when you were showing all those pinball machines that were shipping all over the world, you were talking about some of the design decisions are made because it's a global market. And I was just wanted to give any examples of that. Um, well, um, the, the simplest example is that um, themes have to work in both places. So a lot of times a theme that might be very popular for you guys might not be very popular in Western Europe or vice versa. There's things that, um, you know, um, we didn't know how well Maiden, we knew Maiden was going to do really well in Europe. We didn't know how well it was going to be received here. We were uncertain, you know, we, we thought, mm, I, don't, I don't know, you know. Um, so um, there, there's some technical restrictions. Um, you know, there's there's different approval bodies. You know, uh, UL, FCC, CE, different things. And so a lot of times you you may find, um, you know, you might find some uh, like some device on your machine that you don't understand why it's there, and it's it's a regulatory, you know, thing. Uh, do you? This is a weird question. Do you personally have like a dr like a dream pinball theme? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I've had a lot of dream uh, pinball themes because every time I start one of those things, for some amount of time, it, it, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, I get I you know I can do anything I want. So um, um, I have some that I've. You know, I have more affinity for than others, um, and so um, I, I'm not sure that I've, I'm not sure I'm done making pinball machines. Um, and I think sometimes I think 
maybe that's kind of a retirement sort of thing that like you know like someday many many years from now I'll, you know I'll just uh, after I haven't made any pinball machines for a long time I'll, I'll go into the garage and come out with something <laughs> Do you have a work from home policy for software engineers? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, um, we, we, we give, my guys get a lot of latitude, but, but the reality is that uh, the chemistry of a team is really important. And I think you could see the chemistry of a team coming through with those three guys that you saw in the movie, and that's real, that, that wasn't, you know, uh, there were there were more than three guys there, but, but what I'm saying is that the chemistry of a team is really vital to what the game becomes and is, and um, and and teams are dynamic things, you know. I mean, I've seen, um, and and I've been a part of it, you know. The, the, the projects, you can't sometimes the stars align and you do something, you know. I mean, the stars. I've been very fortunate. The stars have aligned for me some number of times, you know. Um, you know, the stars align for me on Monster Bash. The stars align for me on Lord of the Rings. You know, it's like the, you get the right chemistry between people and you, and you put something together that's, that's pretty cool. And, and so you can't plan it. Every time we step up to the bat, we're trying to hit a home run, you know. And, um, and we're never trying to screw one up, <laughs> you know. I tell people, I work just as hard on the ones that you don't like as on the ones that you love. <laughs> I didn't work any less, <laughs> you know. We have a we have a Lord of the Rings in my office. Awesome. <laughs> Did you bring your resume? Uh, <laughs> sure. Okay. So I think I, I in a roundabout way I answered the question right. They, they need to be together. Yeah. They need to be playing. They need to be standing around the game, talking about what they like and they don't like, um, yelling at the other guy. Um, you know, every, everybody raises the bar and everybody else, right? Um, you know, software guy says, I don't like that shot. Designer's got to go back and fix it. Designer says, that rule is unintelligible to me. You know, software guy, guy's got to think about it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's collaborative. Would you ever be willing to have a satellite office in New England? <laughs> you know, I, lo I love Boston. There you go. I love Boston. I, you know, I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm coming to, a, I'm coming to MIT for a week uh, at the end of uh, July. I'm doing a seminar on, uh, where I'm participating, I'm, I'm, I'm a student in a seminar on uh, additive manufacturing. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to hang around. IT support services. I might know somebody yeah. I can help. Okay, last call. And mark your calendars for June 27th through 30th of 2019. We'll have another round of seminars just as good as this. We'll get people from Stern. We'll get people from those other smaller factories. So come back again. But right now, let's thank George for giving us all this great information.